you're up. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The select board meeting started at 5 o'clock. We went into executive session. We came out of executive session, and there was no action taken. Uh, I want to actually welcome our, one, of our, one of our newest selectmen, Michael Western. Thank you. Thank you. He didn't have anything to do, so we thought that he'd go ahead and try this one out again. <laughs> again. again. <laughs> uh, okay, approve the December 23rd selectmen's meetings. So moved. Second. The first and second. All in favor? Public forum. This is an opportunity for anyone who wants to address the Board of Selectmen with anything other than what's on the agenda this evening. I don't see any hands. Okay. Okay. We're going to uh, go into a public hearing. Uh, and I, I just want to give you a heads up. We're going we're to do all six, seven, eight, and nine. Uh, and I'd like to go ahead and read. It'll be a, a motion. You need a motion to go into public I move, move we uh, open the public hearing. And this is going to be, do I have a second? Second. second. First and second. All in favor? Uh, this will be doing uh, four individuals. Uh, DBA, Captain Fairfield Inn. DBA, the main stay inn. Uh, DBA, the Captain Lord Mansion. And the DBA, Captain Jeffords Inn. Uh, is there anybody here that's representing? There she is. Yep, there she is. If you would like to come up. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Ellen Blood. I work for Lark Hotels. We are the property management group that will be running the four properties. Uh, under the new moniker, the Kenny Bunkport Captain's Collection. Okay. Is there any questions from the public? None? Okay. Well, did, Do you I have, have a, a question? question. Um, did each of these have a liquor license prior to? Yes. Okay, that was... I didn't know if they all did. Yes. Okay. So, hearing nothing from the public... I'll go I'm, ahead and ask for... I move we close the public session. Second. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Now, I would like to go ahead and have to take a vote. I move that vote. we approve all of these as written. And as I said, the, um, the appropriate offic town officials have signed off on these. There's one, there's and one issue. And uh, I just want to mention oh. that with the Captain Lord Mansion, that this does not include Phoebe's Fantasy, okay. which is a, a, another issue. Is there any uh, questions or anything no. on board? No. Okay. You have a motion. Who's a second? I'll second. All in favor? Thank you. Okay. That was easy. Presentation of the FY 2019 audit by Hank Farrar of RKO. How you doing? Doing all right. How's everybody doing tonight? We're doing great. Wish they'd turn up the temperature outside a bit, though. <laughs> <laughs> and in here. We can do this in July if you'd like to come back. <laughs> I could. Um, overall, uh, no exciting news for me, uh, which is what you want. You never want your auditor to show up and have exciting news because we only tell you all the bad stuff that happened in writing. We never say how good you did or anything like that. So when your auditor shows up and says, oh, I got a lot to talk about, uh, that means there was most likely some issues uh, that we found. So I'm going to just jump right into the audit results. Uh, overall, your financial statement uh, received an unmodified opinion. Uh, that's what you're shooting for. Uh, it's what you're shooting for. That means it's a clean opinion. It means uh, everything is fairly stated in all material respects. Uh, we say fairly stated in all material respects because we do not test 100% of your transactions. Uh, so there are a chance that there are misstatements out there, but I feel comfortable that we've gathered enough evidence uh, with our audit uh, that, that our opinion is, is right and there are no misstatements, uh, material misstatements within those financial statements. Uh, we also issue reports required by government auditing standards. This is where we take a look at your internal control over financial reporting, let you know if there's any sort of significant deficiencies or material weaknesses within that internal control structure. Happy to say, no material weaknesses, no significant deficiencies. What you want, a clean report there. 
Uh, we did have a few, a uh, couple minor comments, uh, and these fall well below the range of significant deficiency. We call them management letter comments, or they're notated as other comments in that report. Uh, one of which is uh, just a segregation of duties. I like to remind uh, usually people when there's some sort of segregation of duties issue within the central office. Uh, it's in. It's only a management letter comment because there are plenty of mitigating controls in place uh, that there won't be any sort of impropriety with that segregation of duties. But the biggest issue is uh, Jen's a signer on your checking account, and she also controls all the books. And usually one of the rules uh, with accounting for segregation of duties is someone who has access to the assets shouldn't also be controlling uh, the general ledger. Uh, there are mitigating controls in place, like dual signatures on checks that are over a certain amount. And, and really, I, I really doubt Jack, Jen's going to have the ability to just cut herself checks uh, anytime in the near future. But you know that is a segregation of duty issue that we feel is important enough to, to let you know about. And especially when moving forward, when Jen decides she's going to retire and you replace that person with the next person, <laughs> uh, you, you really want to make sure that you know maybe you shore up that at that point, maybe not give that person uh, signing authority on your checking account. Uh, one other very minor item we found, uh, there was a part-time employee in rec uh, that got paid uh, that didn't really work that week. Um, what happened is a lot of times REC uh, went their part-time employees send over a spreadsheet and that, uh, the category, uh, that summarizes all the time worked by the part-time employees and it uh, just they forgot to remove uh, an employee on there. It came to a total of $440. Uh, somehow we picked that. And we picked that one payroll uh, to test wow. so, to look at. And, and picked that one person. So we spotted that out on there. I mean, uh, you know, I think uh, they're going to change the process a bit and, and have somebody else review that sheet uh, and compare it to the time cards that are actually filled out before uh, they're paying those payrolls. So uh, that was the, the big issues uh, we found during wow. the audit. So uh, uh, I don't think uh, nothing to be up in arms about. Uh, any questions on that before I move into any sort of the financial portion? All right, so we'll switch. Uh, I'll talk about fund balance in the general fund. Uh, overall, your fund balance increased by 490,000 in the general fund, and, uh, and it was 490,000 even, might be the first time I've ever seen that uh, in a set of financial statements. Uh, you can see from the graph that your fund balance is broken uh, down into uh, multiple components. Uh, Non-spendable being the smallest portion, and that's just anything that's actually non-spendable, and that's represented by inventory uh, within the general fund. And then you can see there's a committed and assigned and unassigned. Uh, committed is made up of your carry forwards that get brought forward to the next year. The largest uh, being you have about 110,000 in there for uh, general assistance, and uh, 111,000 in there for the Goose Rocks uh, Goose Rocks Beach Advisory Committee. And there's some other ones out there. And if you wanted to see more detail of those, you could look at pages 47 through 49 in the CAFR, uh, a.k.a. the financial statements. Uh, there's also an assigned portion. Uh, 200000 of that amount is what you've budgeted to use for fund balance in FY20. And the remainder is just encumbrances that will be brought forward to the next year. But overall, you could see that your unassigned fund balance went from around 3.4 and a half million all the way up to 4.1 million this year. And we'll talk a little bit later about the percentage of uh, unassigned percentage of budget. Uh, so why did uh, gen uh, general fund fund balance go up during the year? We'll take a look at these budget to actuals. And more detail can be found on exhibit A2 in the financial statements. Uh, we did change around A2, the look uh, for the expenditures. It's now broken out a little bit differently. It shows uh, the carry forwards from the prior year, it shows the original budget that you passed, and then it shows any sort of budget adjustments that were made during the year. So a new format, I think it's a lot easier to understand uh, when you can see your original budget there, and then you can see the different types of carry forwards and any sort of budget adjustments that happened during the year. Uh, excise taxes, I've been seeing this all around the state, uh, came in higher than budget. Um, a lot of people purchasing new vehicles out there. <coughs> Uh, intergovernmental revenue uh, over budget this year and that was just uh, it's a kind of a one-time thing there's more funding available from uh, the main Department of Transportation uh, so I don't think you'll have these uh, large variances in there that often but uh, there was some MDOT money available uh, that the town got to utilize uh, more building permits uh, issued uh, than anticipated causing an overage and I know there was a one really large building permit issued uh, in 2019 that really helped that one jump up 
Uh, charges for services, uh, most of that was due to more visitors uh, at Goose Rocks Beach during the year. And then interest, we've been seeing this one at all the municipalities. Interest rates are just climbing and they're paying a little bit better interest rates on that money in the bank that you have. The expenditure side. Can I ask a question? Sure. Why are the property taxes that are on uh, page 19 different from what was up here on the chart? It's $100,000 different. I was just trying, all I'm trying to do is understand. So. It's not a big deal. I just, I like numbers to be the same in two places. <laughs> Uh, it's because on this one, the interest on taxes is included in that number. So if you look two lines down, see that interest on taxes? So if you add so that. So you got to know which are combined where. I don't, I don't okay. care, as long as I understand it. Okay. So, and that's, it, it's okay. you just combine those two. If you take a look at A2, so that's your management discussion and analysis. That's actually an unaudited document within your uh, CAFR. That's why if you turn to. This, this is an, un, which one's unaudited? The page you're looking at. The page I'm looking at is, is unaudited. unaudited. So it, why is it in an auditing report? Well, it's the, the format. Uh, there are multiple items that are unaudited uh, in that report. We audit, uh, and the opinion explains what we audit versus what we don't. And the management discussion okay. analysis, we don't uh, render an opinion on. Okay. On pages 64 through 69 is where you would find uh, the information that is audited that matches that. But that you would just have to add up those two numbers together on that page. Okay. So those numbers do actually do tie. It's just you had to add two. I was together. just wondering how the total came out to the same. That's all. Someone got an email. That was you. That was you. I have no idea. It wasn't me. <laughs> Jen, you've got mail. <laughs> On the expenditure side, um, general government uh, came in under budget. Uh, a, a big chunk of that is just due to unused contingency and the overlay uh, portion. And there's some carry forward also uh, for the Goose Rock speech legal fees. Uh, public, safety, public safety had savings in wages, OT and benefits in police and communications. And fire had savings uh, due to less calls and trainings. And then uh, the rest of these, health and welfare, recreation and culture, debt service, and capital improvements are showing variances, but all those amounts were carried forward from a prior year and are being carried forward again into FY20. And that's why I'm saying when you take a look at that Exhibit A2 in the financial statements, you can see what your original budget was versus what was spent, and then you can see the carry forwards and any budget adjustments separately from those. But most of those variances, uh, that are positive, those are being carried forward into FY20 for use then. Uh, unassigned fund bounds as a percentage of your expenditures. So overall, the, the town's policy is to maintain at least 18% 18, 18 in unassigned fund balance. And then usually anything above that targeted amount, you usually identify some sort of capital uh, and push it into the capital improvement plan for capital purposes. Uh, you can see that your unassigned fund balance has climbed steadily from 2017 to 2019. Right now, you're sitting at around 20.5% of your expenditure number, so you're above that 18%. And I believe Jen's, the next agenda item is Jen's going to cover that portion. Uh, over the next page, revenue distribution. Um, this is really showing you where your general fund money is coming in from. Uh, and a lot of times I like to show this because uh, of state funding, and you guys don't get a lot of state funding here at the town of Kenny Bunk, uh, no, in case yeah. you weren't aware. Uh, yeah. uh, but you can see there was a huge jump between 2018 and 2019, and that's really all due to those, those main dot, uh, main dot, uh, main department of transportation funds. I mean, they were higher by about 460,000 from over the prior year. You also received some FEMA disaster money. Uh, which was about 48,000. And the RSU cop share uh, has also went up uh, from the prior year. So you've seen some increases in those 
uh, intergovernmental funds. You can see excise tax is really holding steady at around 5.3%, and your property tax percentage, it took a little bit of a dip, but that's because of that increase in intergovernmental revenue. I assume that the property tax will come back up to around that 88% uh, because you won't have all those one-time fundings that are coming in through the state. Uh, the next two graphs, uh, both pie charts, and this is really comparing 2019 to 2018. I'll let you know if there's any sort of large changes that are out there. And really, everything's held pretty steady. Uh, there's a slight increase in public safety. The one thing I want to point out when you look at the two is you really have to look at capital improvements and transfers out as a combination because we uh, slowly been changing the way the capital is happening. Capital used to kind of be ran through your general fund all the time, and now those are separated out as capital project funds. So now anything you budget to use for capital actually gets uh, notated as a transfer out in your financial statements and go into the proper bucket uh, in the financial statements. So there's a whole section about capital project funds within there that you could see each different capital project fund and how, many, how much funds are available, and I believe that's Exhibit C. Uh, C1 and C2 in the financial statements. So you would see all the monies that you have that you budgeted to transfer out of the general fund for those capital uses. You could see them coming into those funds. And that's all I have uh, for financial information. Are there any other questions? I guess, any questions? Yeah. I guess not. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, before I step down, I want to say I want to thank Jen for all her hard work and everybody else in, in, in the town hall office because we come in there and we really bother them and disrupt their day for a week and a half. Uh, we show up for about a half week uh, prior to June 30, and then after, at year end we show up for a week, and we really do uh, really command her attention. Uh, during that time period and go through a lot of information and you know she puts together this large report uh, every year and we go through and we really don't find much wrong at the town and that's because of all the hard work there at the town hall so I want to thank Jen and everybody else who provides us with the information and helps get us in and out in a timely manner well thank you very much thank you, thank you. and thank we definitely you. do appreciate Jen yes yes we do definitely have a good evening thank hey thanks stick around <laughs> okay. So it might be appropriate to have an, a motion to accept the audited financial statements. Okay. I move that we accept the uh, audit. Second. Second. Third. <laughs> All in favor? Okay. 11. Transfer to Capital Reserve Fund in accordance with the fund balance policy. Ms. Jen? Hello. How are you all doing this is tonight? the moment you've been waiting for, yeah. right? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, um, so in accordance with our fund balance policy, I'm asking um, that you authorize the transfer of 500,576.28 to the Capital Projects Fund, the General Capital Improvements account. So moved. <laughs> Second. Second. Any more discussion? All in favor? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, 12, consider the foreclosure list of tax, uh, four taxes. Uh, I don't see that we have to do anything. Do you? No, this is just our annual check-in foreclosure of um, 2018 property taxes. will be on January 23rd. So we um, give you a list in case there's any you would want to waive foreclosure on. Staff is not recommending that you waive foreclosure on any of those at this time. Okay, so we don't have to do, take any action. No, you do not have to take any action. Okay. Okay, sign the warrant for March 3rd, 2020 special town meeting. Coming up? Sure you are. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, so the warrant that is before you is for the March 3rd presidential primary. We're also going to have an amendment to our land use ordinance regarding public hearing notices. It used to state that we had to publish in a daily newspaper, but with the loss of the Journal Tribune, that isn't as easy to do. So we're changing it so that we can advertise in the weekly York County CoStar as well as on our uh, website. So that's the only change this time around. Sir? We approved that before. Right, we've already. Did you both parties? Both this is to approve the warrant. No, I understand. 
No, the Republicans are as well. Uh, so they're it's not caucusing this year? No, they have to caucus as well. Okay. We're doing it all. So we don't have to do anything with this, correct? You just, you just have need, to sign it. You need to authorize the warrant, okay. and then you'll sign it. All right. Motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? May March 3rd. Okay. 14. Set a public hearing for February 13th, 2020 for public input on ordinance, ordinance revisions. So moved. Second. And first, second. All in favor? Yep. Set the number of shellfish licenses, license fees, and the length of the season. Did you want to talk about that a little bit? The, um, as in your packet, the uh, recommendation of the Shellfish Committee is to maintain the same number of licenses and the um, amounts as well as days. <coughs> so uh, in recreational, we'd have um, 75 resident uh, licenses, eight non-resident, and one license for the warden. In commercial, we'd have two licenses for resident and, not, and zero for non-resident. And daily, we'd have zero licenses. The flats will be open from April 15th through October 15th. Digging would only be allowed Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Recreational diggers could take one peck per week, and commercial diggers could take two pecks per day. So these are the same regulations we had in place this year. Did we sell all of our resident licenses? Yes, we did. We did, okay. Is the Shellfish Committee okay with it? The, this is their recommendation. Okay. So moved. First. Second. Any more discussion? All in favor? Hmm? Okay. One of my favorite topics coming up. <laughs> <laughs> discussion of recycling options. John? I love it. It's always good to be popular. <laughs> <laughs> Tom is passing out some information that was just was received between the time that you received your packet uh, and today. Thank you. In June of last year, the Board of Selectmen authorized the small, small solid waste committee to basically investigate the pros and cons, potential mechanisms, and the financial impact of resuming a publicly funded recycling program in Kennebunkport. Tonight, I'd like to share with you a little bit of the board's current status <coughs> of our investigations. Our intent uh, is uh, to provide the board with the background information on what is possible and what the approximate cost might be. Uh, be the first slide or, yeah, that's perfect. That's good. That's a lovely slide and here we go. So a little background. Uh, this is kind of summarizing some of the, uh, of the main points uh, of the presentation. Uh, this is a, it's a complicated, it's not an easy choice. It's not a chocolate or vanilla choice. There are a lot of different variables uh, that need to be considered in terms of uh, the cost and the impact on the residents and the recycling program itself. Uh, the other point is that the markets are rapidly changing. They're evolving. And this is a national issue. Recycling, what to do about recycling, how to fund it, is something that's being addressed not just here in Kennebunkport, but all across the nation, indeed, all across the world. Uh, and businesses are moving to fill the void that now exists in being able to process recycled material. One thing I was interested to find out is since 19, uh, 19, uh, 2017, over 20 uh, paper mills have made significant investments to be able to incorporate post-consumer paper into their processing streams. So the, the, the industry is beginning to catch up in order to fill the void that was, in my opinion, appropriately left when China said, don't send me your stuff. Uh, uh, and so that's, uh, that's, I think, really, really good news. And the other key piece is education. Education is critical for this to be successful. We've, we've known that, but I think the committee has become more and more convinced that uh, in order for it to be successful, not only do we need to have people understand what is recyclable, what can be thrown away, but even more critically to the finance side to lower the contamination rate. And when I was first hearing this at the meeting a year ago, uh, they mentioned contamination. I didn't know what the heck that was. But uh, the contamination, just for, for the, the public that, that might be listening, is, is when we throw out that pizza box with the stain of oil in it 
or we throw out that jar of mayonnaise that still has the <coughs> reasonable skim of mayonnaise. You know, a little bit of a film, okay. A teaspoon or more, it, it totally uh, uh, negates the uh, value of your recycled material. And it can cost us as a town up to $36,000 if we have dirty, totally dirty, contaminated recycling material. So we pay a fee. In fact, that's on the list that I, that, I, that I handed out. You see the percentage recycling fee. And it can go all the way up to $75, which is on top of anything that we pay. The good news is that what we've seen with EcoMaine's studies is that with the concerted effort, you can definitely get to the 35 and most probably will get to the $0. 35 is the 6 to 10% contamination. So we are very bullish on the fact that a, a focused education will be able to get our contamination rates. I have used, as you'll see later, the 6 to 10, just to be conservative, but I believe we'll be able to get it into the, into the zero. So are there's talking, the key value. We're talking curbside now, correct? Any, 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 anything. Yeah, really, really anything. Now, anything where you're single stream. Okay. Where it's single stream and going to Echo Main. That might be it from a transfer station. Right now, from a well, recycling from center. A transfer station, though, when, I mean, like, just for instance, if we opened our own transfer station, uh -huh. it would be a small one, of course, then we would control what people brought in and we would hopefully be able to eliminate exactly. a lot of that exactly. right there at the source. Exactly. And that's, that's, that's a very key point. Yes. And uh, having a paid staff there to be able to look at it and say, you take that home and throw it in the trash and clean it up better next time. And that, we'll mention that. That's one of the real pros. When we look at the pro-con balance, that's the pro of a, we need to say recycling center just because a transfer station can handle hazardous waste. It has to be licensed, da 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 boom. But a recycling center, no licensing, no permitting. Yeah, enough, I was at the Wells transfer station the other day. What a marvelous yeah. uh, place that is. But yes, that is definitely right. not what we want. Right. Not, not what the infrastructure that we need nor want. I don't know. Algonquin is awesome, too. If you've been to that one, is, yeah, I agree. They're amazing stations. But yeah. you're right. Anything we would look at would have a compactor uh, for the cardboard, uh, and then everything else would just uh, would just be in, in bins, be yeah. in silver bullets. And when I say what we don't want is, I was bringing um, demo material from a house there, right. not recyclables. Right. But right. Right. right, right, right. Yes. And you might want, yeah, exactly. So are you leaning towards drop-off now versus... We'll, we'll talk about where we've come as a committee to a conclusion, and there are pros and cons to each. Like I said, it's not a chocolate or vanilla choice. There, well, there are a lot of different pros I have and some cons. questions about curbside. I, I think well, let, let's, let's go in. Let me, let me run through them sure. quickly because I, I'm hoping there are people that might be hearing this and understanding a little bit of what these options might look like, but I will move quickly. Uh, the next slide is the, uh, uh, the uh, collection options. Thank you. So basically, we think there are three reasonable options you can pursue. <clears throat> One is the curbside, and that's where it would be single stream, basically what we have had in the past, but with some real education that we're throwing in the right stuff and the contamination level is low. Those are going to be key factors. But that would be curbside. So the other, come. On, that, on that particular question, you're, you're talking education, which we really do need, but what is that going to cost? Is there any, there's going to have to be some cost? The cost involved. to us for the education is a summer intern, if we go with EcoMaine. EcoMaine is providing all of the materials that we use for education. They will they have a three-person education staff. They will provide seminars down here. They'll have a large kickoff meeting where we can give out bins and have a whole town. They come down for a full weekend to, to kick off the education. Um, the, I hope that you'll allow the Solid Waste Committee to continue. We would like to be involved in the education part of it as well. They get involved with schools. They have a marvelous program right now. It's called the 2020 Initiative. And the, it's a competition between schools where they have to come up with creative ways to recycle materials. And there's a challenge that goes out and they've got a whole way and things. So it's, we're really working on an education right from the kids all the way up through the people and the residents. And that'll work for either curbside or transfer station. So another one of my questions Recycling center. is, so on the curbside end of things, 
So who's going to be doing the inspections and who's going to say, no, you can't uh, recycle that? Uh, what are we going to do with the yeah. things that cannot be recycled? Are we going to just, would we just leave them there or would we pick them up at a later time? It would depend on how bad it would be. What uh, our suggestion, well, that's the summer intern will be for the first part of it. They'll be following around Casella, whoever's going to do our pickup, and they will grade each bin and you will leave things. So they'll have at least eight different exposures to the community to tell them what was wrong with that bin. There's checklists. EcoMaine has these and they're really well put together. You check out and you give them color tags. You leave them a green, say good job. You leave them a red and you leave the bin. So what are you going to do about Goose Rocks Beach? Goose Rocks, you know, we have a challenge no matter what. And that's where I believe curbside is actually going to be a little more uh, effective than taking it to a transfer station. I, people, the summer residents, uh, week renters, they're not going to run the stuff to a transfer station. No, they're not. You're going to see that stuff going in the trash, and that's going to increase our trash expense, or they will be uh, educated and responsible recyclers and will put that out for a proper recycle bin. There will be stickers in every one of the rental units. We'll be working closely. That's the other piece of the Echo Main piece is to... Uh, focus on realtors and landlords to be sure that they have the magnets, the education, the printed material in their, in their flyers, in their instructions. And a lot of our people come from towns and centers that are, are really quite dedicated to recycling, uh, given the people that come that rent here. So I, I don't think it's going to be that, that large an issue. Unfortunately, I, I would disagree with that because I, I do manage a couple of properties here in town that are seasonal. And you're right, a lot of places do recycling, a lot of people want to, but recycling is different in different states and different communities. And we put out signs and tell them, these are the ones in Kennebunk now because we're not doing it here, and they still put the wrong things in. You, you know, they come and they. Tell and Kenny Buck, let's face it. I, I know, I know. Go ahead. And I'm then, sorry. I'm you sorry. know, and of course, we know how their trash system works, so that backs things up and yeah. causes problems because you get this little, you know. But um, I think you can educate the people in town. I, I do think that you can educate the year round and the, and the, the long term summer residents. But I'm not sure you, you can, can motivate your renters. They lose half the security deposit. Uh, period. Yeah, they're not going to do that. We're well, not going to do what? No, I'm just saying the landlords aren't going to do that. Well, you got the power to make them. I mean, there are things we can do, guys. Well, you can put some teeth in this. That's why I think that we need some more specifics. Well, we're uh, working. Okay. And you're you're going there. You're going in the right direction. I mean, well, I'm let's, not. Let's continue. I'm not on. opposed to this. I, I like the recycling. Let's let's continue center. on. We're moving moving along. So we've got, well, no, sorry, we're moving along. We've got the, uh, the collection option. So again, uh, the think, recycling. I think it's very good the selectmen are engaged. Oh, so yes. I'm, I'm stoked. This is good. I, I really appreciate your comments. Uh, the, uh, the recycling center, most probably Beachwood. I think it would make the most sense uh, uh, at, the, uh, at the town facility at the old dump, which I think is appropriate. Uh, and there the residents would, would drive, what, uh, Wednesday afternoons so we wouldn't compete with the, uh, with the program, and then Saturdays and Sundays. And then a hauler, most probably Casella, would either would take the material to Eco Main uh, if it's single stream, or they would have to farm out their own sources if it's sorted. And we'll talk about sorted because that's another whole sorted tale. So uh, moving along for uh, I'm the still next. on curbside right now. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll come back to it. Okay. We will come back. All right. Yeah, we're not we're not off that. So the uh, the question is if to sort or not to sort. Really, the only option to sort is at the recycling center. If we're going to do curbside, it'll be single stream, and you also have the option for single stream at a recycling center. Single stream has the advantage that it takes everything. I was going to ask you if you could go ahead. In, in the audience and, and everybody Explain. watching TV, what single stream exactly. means. Exactly. Well, yeah, so it will take everything. So what single stream means is that you can throw your paper, your cardboard, your pasteboard, which was a new thing I learned. Uh, a cereal box is not cardboard. No. I always thought it was. It's not cardboard. If it doesn't have the little crinklies in between the two smooth layers, yeah. it's not cardboard. 
not for this definition. That's called pasteboard, and that is recyclable but as mixed paper. Indeed, it's part of the mixture of mixed paper. So you can't put a cereal box in a cardboard recycling bin, which I've been guilty of, and I won't do it again, I promise. So, so yeah. wax line boxes. I get people asking me about wax line boxes. Where does it go? Trash. Trash. That's trash. I'm afraid that's a fact. Okay. And your, your, which is the same with your Starbucks coffee cup. Trash. Okay. Yeah. And that's, you know, there's the education. Nobody, nobody knows that. Well, they're going to. Yeah, By yeah. golly, the they're going to. <laughs> What's that? Part of the, part of the education. education. Yeah, they're, they're going to be sick of hearing it. Is what is okay. going to. We're going to be so much winning. Uh, so the uh, the paper, the pasteboard, cardboard, one to seven plastics. So the full range of plastics go into zero stream. Glass, uh, tin cans, obviously mostly iron, but iron tin tin uh, coated cans and aluminum cans. So it's it's the whole whole she bang. Anything that has a little triangle on the bottom of it. Uh, as well as cardboard and all your mixed paper and glass. As long as it's clean. And as as it, clean. yes, it's recyclable. It, 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 uh, yes, exactly. It, it is not going to be acceptable to us unless it is clean. That's going to be the key. And that's the education. So they can throw the tin cans in the recyclables at curbside and they could not, and they may not be cleaned and they'll get discharged, correct? If they don't clean them properly, yes, we, we will get we will get charged a contamination fee, right? And they will get a, a black mark on their on their bin when uh, when we go and inspect it, and they'll they'll learn to do that. Well, I'm just curious if when these people go by and inspect everything, and they refuse it, what are we going to do with it? Are we going to make them take it back in their home, or are we going to make are if we it, if pick it, it up or what? If it totally no fails, we're going to leave it, I mean, and they'll either clean it or and put it out again next week as recyclables, or they'll throw it in the trash. That'll be their choice. Okay, but you have to leave it right out. there at the at where they. Put, if where if they it's put beyond it. a certain level of dirty, if it you know if it's within the range, then you take it, and then we. But you give them a yellow card, and you tell them what they've got to do better next time. So there's there's gradations of failure in this. Huh? Okay. Okay. So the. Um, <clears throat> so the sorted option is, is a little trickier. The, the sorted option uh, will only take what is saleable. And so that's cardboard, one and two plastic, tin cans, and aluminum cans. That's it. The bad news is that's only about 40%, probably less, of the total weight. Mixed paper and glass and the three to seven plastics make up well over 60% of the weight of what could be recycled, that's going to go into our trash at $78 a ton. So we're going to pay for that if we do this sorted option at the recycling center. So that's one of the caveats. This will come up when we look at the cost indicator. But that's one of the caveats of sorting at the recycling center instead of doing single stream at the recycling center. Fair? All righty. So now pros and cons. So what we'll be trying to do here, and this is an eye chart, folks, sorry. Uh, but what, what, we're, what we looked at, the, the main factors are, what is the most effective to get materials into the recycling stream? So what works the best to get the most things recycled? That's one thought. What is, gives us the greatest flexibility to respond to a changing market? And this is something I think we do need to consider carefully. If we put sunk cost into a recycling center and then a year, two years from now, the market's changed from under us and we really want to do something else, we're not going to have the flexibility to move, as, as flexible to move. We'll have sunk costs. So that's a thought. The degree of inconvenience to our seniors and physically challenged folks is a consideration. And then on the cost side, each one of these adds a different amount of, of uh, material into our waste stream. The, the curbside, the least material. The most is going to be put into recycling. If we do single stream at the recycling center, you just aren't going to get the volume. People are not going to go there. Some people are not going to go there. Your volume is going to be less, and that volume is going to be put in the trash. So you're going to increase your trash with the recycling center no matter what. 
And if you do the sort at the recycling center, you're going to have a substantial increase in the amount of trash you're going to have to pay for to throw away. So these are just trade-offs on the economic side. And the final one is that, or two more, you need a capital investment with the, uh, uh, with the recycling center, and you also need to pay for a staff at the, at the recycling center. So those are financial factors that go into the choice of whether you're doing curbside or one of the two options at recycling center. Fair? Mm -hmm. So if we look at the pros and cons just quickly, uh, the curbside, it's familiar, it's convenient, you're going to get the most volume of recyclables, that's, that's a no-brainer. There's no sunk cost, uh, you have the least degree of <coughs> impact on your flexibility, say you have the most flexibility to respond to, trade, to changing markets, um, no capital investment, no new staff, and you have full support of EcoMaine's education staff, so that's pretty good. That's curbside. The cons is it's a greater challenge to keep the contamination level low. There's no doubt it's a greater challenge. Uh, and there is a, as you'll see in the finances, there's a higher annual cost in the following years after our capital investment. So if you're looking at just the numbers, um, the, the uh, recycling center looks a little better on the financial side. When you look, in, well, we'll talk about that at the end. All right, so Recycling Center, we've got uh, uh, pros and cons there. Now, if we look at the single stream option at the Recycling Center. So here, the folks are bringing in their stuff. They separate out the cardboard. That will compact. reason we do that is the hauling fee is so much less. You can get 10x, maybe more for the good compactor, on the cardboard. And so the, the cost to haul it, it's worth investing in the compactor to be able to haul the cardboard. So our uh, recycling center would probably exist, uh, consist of a uh, compactor with a 40-yard uh, pull and then silver bullets to take the other uh, recyclable parts of the, of the zero stream, the uh, single stream. Uh, so what are the pros? You've got the paid town staff there to ensure contamination is low. That's, that's a key piece of a pro on the uh, recycling center. Uh, you reduce the waste by 300 tons if you do the single stream instead of the 400 tons if you did curbside. Uh, it does offer an opportunity for composting, which is kind of a cool pro. The con is you've got the upfront capital expense. You're less flexible to react to markets. You reduce the seasonal participation, in my opinion, the hassle factor. I think you're going to have less from our renters going into the stream. Uh, and it's a physical uh, burden to uh, our seniors and the physically challenged residents to get to that recycling center on those days. As far as whether we go to a sort option of the recycling centers, the pros are about the same as single stream. Uh, you've got the low contamination because of the town. You reduce the tonnage by 150, but that's not very much. That's going to be on the con side. And uh, you have the opportunity for composting on the cons. You've increased the trash to landfills by 250 tons minimum because uh, you're not recycling paper, mixed paper, glass, and the three to seven plastics. Whew, lot, right? Okay. What a mouthful. So this is all clear, right? So the uh, so let's let's look let's look at the uh, at the costs. And uh, of course, that's an eye chart for me. And uh, can I steal the big Um, no, no. So here, the first thing to do is to go through the assumptions because you need you need to understand what these numbers were based on. So, it's an, so do you just need to know that they don't have an updated slide in front of them because of the change in the cost that came through? Exactly. All right. I will make note of there's only one place that that occurred. So you just want them to know they should look at the screen. Yeah, good luck, huh? <laughs> I hope your eyes are better than mine. Uh, can we put that on, well, do you want to put it back there you want to leave it there? Well, just leave it, it's we'll just good. We got it. it. So let me tell you about the, um, let me tell you about the assumptions. Oh. Boom. Ah, there that's you. better. I you guys got to move. move. I'll get down. Move over some more, man. Thanks, sorry. I won't run your over too bad. Come on. Yeah. Yeah, I can look at your book. 
We'll be out in the parking lot. Soon. I know. <laughs> so here's How's here's that? what here's what these numbers back. are based on. The the uh, the annual recyclables we're calling it 400 tons because that's what we had in, in 2018. Casella's weekly charge $100,000. We just learned that's $104,000. That wasn't even time to get into my slide, so that's gone up a little bit. But it's it's a ballpark. These are meant to be ballpark. Uh, the uh, the tipping fee uh, now I've shown it as 95. Now that's a little bit higher. It showed 65 on your chart, I believe. And the reason why that needs to be raised is the, uh, and, uh, we, the Echo Main people, Eco Main people, Eco Main, Echo Main, I'm going to call it one or the other, it's ECO Main, have uh, uh, grandfathered us in to the $65 a ton uh, uh, contract they did? vehicle. They you, did. You, they, they wrote did. it? They sent you a yeah. confirmation? Yeah, okay. yeah, they sent confirmation. They, they'd like a response pretty soon. We'll talk about that later. But uh, uh, yes, and uh, you saw the other options. This one, is, but there is a year-end true-up based on what the actual cost per ton was for the production. Right now, their productions this year are 95 to $100 a ton. <laughs> Therefore, had we been under this contract, we would have owed them a true-up of $35 a ton. If the estate was ninety-five dollars, was the true? We paid sixty-five. We owe them thirty-five. So I've put ninety-five here per ton as the the number to look at what our costs are going to be. That will go up in the future if the market for paper and others go down. It will go down in the future if the markets start to rise, and the markets are going to rise. I the other the other article I sent, and I'm going too long, aren't I? So I, we handed out a, a, an art, a, a page to you, and you saw that uh, the one to two plastics is up 33% over last year. I mean, the markets are coming back. Aluminum is up. They're getting more money on their iron. They're still paying $55 a ton to get rid of mixed paper, but they're sending it to West Virginia. It's not going overseas. And they have to pay $10 a ton to get rid of cardboard to send it up to the paper mill. So these numbers, I believe they'll change as the, as the industry starts to respond to these new sources. But right now, I think these are the realities. So uh, contamination costs, you'll notice that I put up there a $35 uh, a ton on curbside. I, that is assuming a 6 to 10% contamination. All of EcoMaine's Analyses have shown with concerted education, you can get it down below that and pay zero. That is the results that they've seen. I believe that's where we'll be. But I'm going to put 35 just to be uh, conservative You're here. You're very optimistic. <laughs> Fair enough. And so I'll, I'll put it here. And I, 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 I've got 35 here. I'm with you. Um, but when you run all those numbers down, we have our education. We've got our intern in there for 500 hours. Uh, then we're at $172,000 uh, 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 a, a year. Now, the other piece on this taxable unit, what I've, what I've done there is I've taken all of the residential, the mixed use, and the commercial taxpayers, so the, the units that pay, it's 3040 is what the town told me is the number to use. So what I'm doing is dividing that cost by those number, and it's really the average, right? because it's, it's looking across. Some people pay more, some pay less. It's $56.58 is what that would be per year per taxpayer out of our revenues. Um, it's, it's money, but uh, that's a per year to be responsible in our recycling. If we look at the recycling center, the second one, single stream, uh, there we've got the capital expense are above the line. Uh, so it's showing the 26K for the prep and the 31K for the compactor. Uh, we've got an attendant, so we have to put 1,500 hours for, uh, for the attendant. We've got a 20 buck an hour plus 100% overhead, give us 40 bucks an hour. We're looking at about 80 halls at $250 a haul. You can see how we've done it. We've put down the tonnage a little bit because I think there's going to be only three quarters of the people at best will go there that would have recycled at the curb. I think that's optimistic, but we'll leave it there. Um, 
$38.16 a year per taxable unit. Then we go down to the recycling center where we're sorting. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a difficult one. I hope we don't go this way because it, it really has a lot of complicated and a lot of unknowns to it. But it is the least expensive uh, at $30.59 and, uh, uh, per, per household or per taxable unit. So, uh, that's the cost compared. Any, any questions on that before we go into education? Those are my last two slides. Yeah. I think, you know, in terms of effectiveness, John, if you look at the cost and associated with how much you're actually going to recycle, you would also see a different analysis. Oh, I think that's a wonderful idea. Your curbside, you would be... Far more... You would be far yes. more for the money you're spending... Exactly. ...than, than the recycling right. center. Excellent thought. And that's... A, that's a, an absolute solid conclusion. Again, you can see the tons recycled for the uh, for the cost. It's a it's a big difference. Um, let's go. If there are no questions here, let's go to education. Again, I, I got a I yeah, got a my, comment I, I'd like to make. Yeah. Listening. Notice I listened to everything that you said. Okay, I appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> uh, I I I know there's. Uh, uh, division here probably regarding uh, the appropriateness of curbside uh, pickup but boy I got to tell you uh, that 40 percent of our people that live here in town are over 65 and a lot of them including myself are 75 or older and it's very very difficult I've had this comment from a number of people while I stood out there the other day when, at voting <laughs> that a number of people saying that we've got to have curbside, I can't get to the trans, I can't, I can't go to Kennebunk, I can't. And then <laughs> one woman was, was talking to me about the $10 fee and this and so forth. But, so I think when you factor everything in, when you take a look at the, how old we are here in Kennebunkport, and I think we've got enough intelligent people in here in this town to be able to do a really good job with curbside pickup uh, because I really think it's the most effective way for us to do recycling. I think we get the most opportunity out of it. It's What's my that? own opinion. It's most let's, let's, uh, thank you. Let's, let's go to the education slide. Uh, this is looking if we did the sort at the recycling center. The downside, again, to sorting the recycling center is that we lose the education support of uh, EcoMain. And I think that's a significant loss. We would be totally on the hook to build our own educational material. Um, it, it, it just really wouldn't, uh, in my opinion, work as well. I'll give you a second to digest that slide, and then we'll, we'll, we'll move on. To the next slide, please. This is now uh, either, this is single stream, either curbside or recycling. This would be the education plan we've put together. Uh, they've got a three person department. They have stickers for bins, the do's and don'ts cards, fridge magnets. This reencyclopedia app is kind of cool, but it's something you put on your phone. Kids will love it. Uh, access to the videos, press releases, the youth education I mentioned, uh, uh, and the coordination with consolidated school. Uh, the town uh, intern and the software committee would work with Casella and the startup uh, in order to educate uh, on site uh, by marking and grading the bins to reduce contamination. Uh, and the uh, work with the realtors and the uh, uh, landlords to be sure that our summer folks are made well aware of, of the importance of cleaning, uh, keeping contamination low and what is recyclable. And the next slide is our recommendation. Uh, we do recommend curbside. Uh, we believe it's the most flexible uh, to be able to address changing markets. We believe it has, we know it has, the largest potential to reduce solid waste volumes and therefore save us money and put more largest variety of material into the recycling stream, which is the third bullet. Uh, I think it's the best option to capture the rentals recyclables. It's the most sensitive to our seniors and physically challenged. It avoids increasing town staff, and it's $26 per year more expensive on the average household than the cheapest option. So for these reasons, we feel pretty strongly. The next, the next slide. 
uh, is just uh, to ask your questions, also to recognize the committee. Uh, Mike Klaus has just been awesome as our fearless uh, town representative. Uh, he's taken a lot of flack from us for different things. Uh, I, I'm the stucky to give the presentation. Uh, Dave Inelton is with us here. Uh, Harvey was not able to be. Paul Hogan, someone I'm sure you don't know or recognize. He's the gentleman <laughs> in the green sweater in the back. Uh, and Tom McLean, uh, Kinder Wilson was here and is here with us as well. So open for your questions. I have just one, and it's about education. I think we need more uh, than uh, place cards and, and telephones and stuff like that. I think I'd like to see some hands-on education from people that really, really know that could maybe we could have a few meetings, you know, to try to help people because there's a lot, there's Perfect. so much more to this than a lot of people realize. No, and I, I think that's going to, and it really is part of it. Again, there's there's a whole weekend kickoff, and then there'll be follow-on seminars where we'll have people, we'll invite people in, we'll go to the schools with the kids because yeah. the kids go home and start yelling at mom, yeah. they're not washing out the peanut jar, you know. No. So that's yeah, yeah. You could certainly set something up during voting. I know you guys have. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Where's that voice come? Huh? No, oh, I said, oh, that was yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, you know, during voting, if you set up a display of what's recyclable and what isn't. Exactly. That you know, we get a lot of people through here. Right. Yep. Very good idea. Pictures. Right. Pictures yeah, you know, style. I'm fine with curbside recycling. Uh, I'm just concerned about the vast amount of weekly rentals we have, and I don't think you're going to change their behavior, given my personal experiences with some, and it's not, again, that a lot of these people do want to do the right thing, but, you know, educating them is going to be much more difficult. <clears throat> It's something we need, to, we need to talk about and try to find a, yeah. a, a way to do that. And, but again, we could talk about this all night. <laughs> I wouldn't have a problem if we, with the, with the curbside, if we could really get the education out and keep the contaminants down low and the recyclable up high so we don't have to throw it in the trash and waste our money. Well, you're, you're laying down the gauntlet to this committee, and we're willing to, I think I can speak for us, we're willing to accept it, because without the education, it can't be successful, and if it's not successful, then, then we failed. Our commitment's to make this successful. You certainly we demonstrated your commitment to this, and we do applaud you for that. Right. It's, it's going to work. Thanks, John. I think Thanks. Paul has something to say. Sure. Well, both Absolutely. of them. Absolutely. <laughs> You guys can fight over. <laughs> um, the committee fully understands the challenge of Goose Rocks. Um, Timing-wise, it's a little challenging for this year. In a perfect world, you would approve this tonight. The money would come. We'd start it on June 1st. Um, and, um, you know, the leases are being signed right now. I have a rental property, too. I have a security deposit I get from everybody. Most renters ask me, what do I do about recycling? You know, I have it written, but most people ask me, particularly the Canadians, they all ask you. Um, so I would put it, um, you know, in, in, in my lease that said that security deposit, part of the return is that you didn't get a, a reject bucket on a Saturday, 20 bucks or whatever it is. Um, but that kind of begs the question, which I think we need to talk about, is, is recycling mandatory? If you went with this scheme, curbside, is it mandatory? Do we have an ordinance that says you should recycle because I think landlords are going to be more, if we don't have such an ordinance, landlords are just going to say, just throw it in the, you know, throw it in the bin, don't worry about it. Um, if there's an ordinance that says you need to recycle in County Bunkport. You don't have one. No. I know, I, 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 I'm pointing that out. Well, I think, we we I, could discuss think, that all night and right. I think it is something that's that's worth discuss, yeah. discussing, but as Not to your tonight. point about no, goose no, rocks. No, no, I'm just, I'm just raising it as an issue in, uh, in connection with this. You know, we've discussed goose rocks, but it's town wide. There are, there are there seasonal, all over the there place. every, Cape Orpus is now full of them. Right, certainly, thank you. I think it was a wonderful presentation. Yeah. Like a great, yes. guys, Very uh, great work. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I just wanted to pass on what, what Mike had to say. The KRA has not conducted a survey on this thing, but I can't tell you how many hundreds of emails I've had that said, we can't understand why a town as wealthy as Kennebunkport can't come up with some kind of a reasonable recycling program. And without question, curbside 
recycling is the preferred method to do it for the various reasons. A lot of older people that can't go to take stuff away. And uh, education is a problem, sure. But it's better than not doing anything. And right now, we're sitting here not doing anything. Now we've shut down Bradbury's. No, You've got a small bin down. over yeah. there. We didn't do that. I know you didn't do it, but it's shut down. Yeah. Yeah. It is shut and we got a small bin for cardboard over in the dock square. I went over last week to put cardboard in. I had to push like hell to get something in there. Wait till next and without week. Brad, yeah. raise wait till next week. <laughs> so, I just encourage you to move forward on this thing. And I personally, I wholeheartedly support the curbside recycling. And I think if you were to conduct a general survey of residents, you'd find that they're willing to pay that 35, 45, 50 bucks increase in their taxes to do it. I'm, I'm, not say that I'm, not, I'm not <laughs> saying that I'm not in favor of curbside. I'm, what I'm saying is I just I would like to hear how we're going to handle it. Yeah. And, and until tonight, I was, I didn't, yeah. I mean, John did a great job this evening, yes. absolutely. And it sounds like the recycling market is going in the right direction, whereas when we made this decision, it seemed like it was going in the exact I opposite direction. That's a huge problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I saw an article the other day where a guy in Houston to build small houses. Perfect. Um, Adidas is putting out s sneakers that that's using recycled plastic. You know, and as I said before, the Perfect. ultimate solution lies with us not using so many things that need to be recycled or need that we are such a consumer society. But I go into Hanover for two or three times a week, and almost everybody now goes in carrying plastic. Clink. Bags yeah. Or yeah. I have yeah, them. I always yeah. just forget and have to buy the paper bags. I do too. Yeah. Hi, I'm Mary Gickness, and I live over on Gravelly Brook Road. And I just wanted to address the cost issue because, and you all may have a different experience, I don't know, but in my house, for the four months that we had to pay for recycling over on C Road, we spent about $100. So that's for four months. So that's $300 a year. So if you're telling me, $56, I'm saying that's a bargain. You know, and I don't know what you each have paid by taking your recycling. I don't know, but, um, you know, that's a lot of money. And if I don't know how many houses there are in Kennebunkport, but 300 times a couple thousand, it's a lot of money. Well, you have to realize one thing that we did not want to do away with recycling. We just didn't have the money for it at the time because it was a huge it bill and it was not in the budget. We were caught off guard, we didn't know, nobody told us anything about that. So we didn't pull the recycling. We just didn't have the money in the budget. For it sounds year. like it just kind of got left by the wayside. That it no shouldn't pun have intended. been a surprise no really, intended, yeah. right? What's that? It, yeah. I mean, yeah, it shouldn't have been like a surprise that the contract was ending, but No, anyway. it was it's a contract with the prices changed because as I said, last year recycling, you know, after we put it out or whatever, you know, the as a commodity was going down. And now it sounds like it's starting to go back up, you know, the, the scale great. has tipped. I just wanted you guys to know what it actually But we're trying costs. to fix it. And but we're, I'm, we're that's getting good. There. I'm glad. We're getting there. I'm glad. I'm going to be watching. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what we want to do is when we bring this back in one form or the other, we want it to be a model for other communities, not just because we can throw money at it, but we don't want to throw money just to make ourselves feel good and say, oh, I, I put it in the recycling bin and, the, and who knows where it goes. Anyway. And that's what we were told, that most of what we were recycling was going straight into the trash. trash. 70 to 80%. Yes. Because yeah. of the contamination level. That's correct. correct. That's correct. So yes. we're going to fix that, right? Right on. Yep. There you go. Yeah. And well, again, I commend you guys. You're doing a terrific job. And I've learned a lot about recycling, and I thought I knew a great deal about recycling. Well, things have changed. What I learned is I was a big contributor to the contamination. We all were. So moving right along, and thank you, John, yes. Mike. Yeah, thank you, uh, all of you. Yeah. Yeah, I wish you had a little more enthusiasm, John. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, transfer of brush truck to Atlantic Fire Company. Different kind of recycling. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. right. <laughs> this is a good recycling. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. It's all uh, good. It is. But this, this is a, a 45 year old vehicle yeah. uh, that we're, we've oh replaced God. in last year's budget. 
Um, so we're just a I'm just asking to have it transferred, which has been the norm, uh, have it transferred back to the fire company, and they can dispose of it. So moved. Uh, and Second. I have a question. What are they going to do with the money when they sell it? Well, I have um, in in the uh, not last year, but the year before's town meeting. It was in the it was in the budget. Remember, we couldn't get the vehicle, so it ended up right. getting pushed for another year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that in there, it was voted that that we they give it back to them, and the, and the money was to go to anything uh, firefighting equipment, anything that we would we could use that they wanted to purchase. It would become. The town it would become town property um, in that case and I had to kind of approve that you know it's our our mission right now we don't need say another boat you know that I would say I would say no to that it has to be approved by me my unbinding uh, asking is that it gets put in uh, the Atlantic volunteer engine company's Kittredge money for future purchases of, of fire trucks that sounds that good. Sounds good. Um, and this, you know, being a being a 1974, I'm, I don't know trucks, older trucks, but I'm I'm guessing somewhere in the ten to twelve thousand dollar range wouldn't be out of the question. And I have newer trucks that are bigger out there that I wouldn't get that money for. So how many miles are on the truck? I'm not 100 percent sure if the odometer works, but last time I checked it, it was <laughs> because it was only at 8,900 and change. Oh. It probably that's um, probably yeah. true. Yeah, I mean it's it's the, like the new no, one. It's no, no. going to be used for brush fires, and and hauling one of our rescue boats. Excellent. Okay. Well, I've made a motion to um, give it back to the fire department. And I seconded it. First and second. Any more discussion? All in favor? Yeah. To Atlantic Fire Company. Yes. Thank you. Okay, 18, discuss road moratoriums. Mike? Hi, Mike Claus, Public Works. Uh, we've had a couple street opening requests recently, uh, Langsford Road and Ocean Avenue, where people have wanted to get into newly paved roads for utility connections. Um, so what I'd like to do is, is have a, a more formal, no, formal notice when we're paving roads that there's going to be a moratorium in existence. Uh, when we develop our capital plan, I, I'd like to be able to s send a notice out to abutting property owners on those roads that we're going to be paving them and a moratorium is going to come into place um, and publish it on our website what roads we're paving, how long the moratorium is going to be, and, and just try to get, get it out there a little better that we're paving roads and we'd like, if you've got a utility connection you're going to make, please make it ahead of time. Um, I think that's an excellent idea, Mike. Yeah, yeah. I like what you wrote, and but I'd also like to see that you were to put that second page in there, which explains what you expect from it. Okay. We have two pages here. <coughs> yeah, the second right? page. Yep. And I think the second page uh, explains pretty good how you expect to have it fixed. So what I'd like to do is just have this, you know, start this as a policy, and then if it works, we can move it into ordinance language. I mean, we can start it just as a public works policy for now okay. um, to get it going this year. And if you guys, if it works, we can you do guys that. can yeah. put teeth into yeah. it. Laurie? You can do it as a policy. Okay. Um, I mean, the board can set all kinds of policies, but you would need to adopt it as a formal policy. Okay. So, meaning we need to put it out to the voters or the... No. 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 I, I just mean a vote from you. Okay. Right. Just and, and, and I'd like to, not that I, I think it's a good idea, but what happens when somebody sells a, a piece of property, say, next door to them, the, and they want to put up a house, and now it's year three, and that somebody wants to move into it, do you tell them, oh, I'm sorry, you can't move into it for three years? You can't move into it because they wouldn't have built it if they couldn't open the road. Well, there's, there's always a there, there, there's always the ability to come to you guys direct and, and make an appeal, a well, hardship Isn't that appeal. what people have been doing anyway? Yeah, yeah. emergency. It, we're either yeah, going to have but, this and enforce it or not, because if you remember the last time when we right. talked about it, I was a little upset because we said we weren't going to open up an Ocean Avenue, and we opened it up. And well, I was the only one who voted against it. Right. So either make this policy <clears throat> and stick to it or don't bother. 
So even in hey, I'm talking to the board, not to you, Mike. But even in this policy and all ordinances and municipalities, the road moratoriums, there's still always an emergency. There's emergency, absolutely. And, and the definition of emergency will come down to this board. Yeah. So it is not black and white. I just want to be clear, that's yeah. not going to fix that. Yeah. I want to build a house on this lot that I want to sell is not an emergency. No, no, no. But um, say somebody ha owned a piece of property and paid for it, and now all of a sudden they want to retire, and they want to build that house now. So if, if that road is paved and you... You know, somebody is 65 years old. You have to wait till you're 70 no, to put get it, into the house. I think it should be left to the discretion of the board. Right, and that's but what with we're this, doing with now. This, but right now, before, we didn't have anything, really, did we, Mike? Well, the, the, the issue is we never, you know, the, the property owner who sold the house, we would, we would have given that property owner written notification that the road was going to be paved, and if they want to make a utility connection for a lot they owned, they should make it now. Before, we never did that. We never did that. Right. So we'll right. be doing that going forward. So right. that person who sold the lot, you know, was given notification. You know, obviously the person who's buying it, we didn't notify, but, but you know, the person selling the lot, you know, they could, we, they, they could ask us, say, they, they say, is there a moratorium? And say, yes, well, why didn't you put the utility in? And that, that may affect the sale price. I, I don't know. But, but certainly it gives us... We would have told the person selling the property that there's going to be a moratorium. And I'm not even talking about selling a piece of property. I'm talking about people who have owned a piece of land here. And their plan in their head is that they're going to retire in two years and move yeah. up. Well, they're, they and would so be they notified. Wanna, and so they want to build a house. Right. So we would, before we pave the road, they'll get a letter saying if you... If you want to build on your prop on, a, on vacant land along this road, stub put the stub in now. It before. wouldn't specifically say that. Well, I mean, but that would say but. <laughs> we're going to put a moratorium in effect for the next five years. You know, now is your time to act. If there's anything you want to dig up the road for, and this is your time period in which to do it. And that would go to the property owner. So I think that's what's yeah. different about this proposed policy ordinance, whatever you want to call it is before we were just kind of internally saying if there's a moratorium, but we weren't giving public notice. And so Mike would now have a process where we give public notice, we give people a time period, and we publicize on the website the roads that are in moratorium status. And you really wouldn't have to force them to build a new house. They could just put in a connection to a stub. Correct. So that they could build a house still in five right. years. Yeah, there's stubs in under the roads in lots of places in town that there's no house. Oh, What's New, a stub? New Biddeford Road. A connection to, connection connection to, the, to the sewer, sewer the water. water. And you can always put drill a well and put your own septic system in, too. So, so... I mean, we the, did it with the, with the parcel right up here. We put the... Yeah, there's a stub there. The, so we don't so have to under, up the road. under the road where the sewer or water line is, there's a pipe that comes out and it just goes a little beyond the pavement. But and, it's and the property off. owner would have to. And then the pro so it would, it would be packed. And then and then when you're ready to connect, you dig up in your driveway, not in the road, and you connect to that. Stub. Like I know what you're saying. Okay, you know. Saying. Yeah. So, uh, my my question is, and I know where you're standing on this, Ed. But you're, it's a black and white with you. But I, I'm, I'm still thinking it should be at the discretion of the board to be able to make the final say on that. That's my opinion. I think this is great. I think it's something that we haven't done before. But there's always something that comes up that is out of the ordinary. There's so many different problems, and then I don't. And it may even affect the town if we put an ordinance in place and we stick by it, and then. Something along comes along. Well, we've got an ordinance; you can't do anything about it. So it's defined it as an emergency situation. But it, but the language That's, covers that. The language yes. covers that. It says, unless an emergency condition exists, or unless the necessity for making such an installation could not reasonably have been foreseen at the time, time notice was given. But what is an emergency? It's not no, it doesn't say emergency. It, it, it said, unless the necessity for making such Insulation could not reasonably have been foreseen at the time such notice. I think that's that covers what okay. what Sheila right. says. Okay, I'm 
Fine. That's what I think. Okay. So am I right or am I wrong? I guess that's open to interpretation. It's, it's, Not if you're right or if you're wrong, but what uh, would con what would be considered an unforeseen event? You know. Again, if property changed hands and the new owners were not made aware that there was a moratorium, Is it and that, they didn't, that's an unforeseen event. Yeah, to me. but in that yeah. in that case, it doesn't make any sense to have a moratorium because you're going to open the road. You're going to say, okay, we can open up the road. The idea is to protect the road because the taxpayers. Paid for it, and this is yeah. this is my thoughts on yeah, the whole thing. Yeah, but this thing. is where I where I, I, I see Alan's point of view. Yes, uh, that you know you can't, and I see Sheila's point of view. That you know somebody buys a piece of land, had always been pe planning to retire, and then somebody says you can retire, but you got to wait four years or three years. It, it, to me, that's not what we're about. No. You know? So my point to to my end, Mike, is either we either do it or we, and and we. We don't allow that, but we just don't bother because all we're going to do is make exceptions. We did that a couple well, meetings ago. On, on the first page, we've got the requirement that they mill and fill paving 25 feet either side of the opening. It's like fixing a dent in your car. <clears throat> they make it look new. Yeah, I got a dent in my wife's car and somebody <laughs> bumped into it and the Bondo fell out. So that wasn't a very good plan. No. That sounds like a personal problem. <laughs> but, but I'm saying, well, it was it was fixed until it wasn't. And you know, you know this, this is New England and the roads the expand analogy. and contract. Yeah. I, that, I don't see the analogy here. But anyway, there's a way to fix it and uh, I, I think, think we've covered idea, it. Mike. It's just we got to figure out the best way to do it, I think. I think it's a good idea. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, go ahead and set the policy. Yeah. Yeah. As long okay. as we have an option. All right. We can, I think we can work that out. Okay. So do I have a motion? Okay. So we have this. to? I have a first. Do I have a second? Mm-hmm. All in favor? Second. So what are you motioning? Yeah. To yeah. adopt the policy. To adopt the policy. So the only language that you have before us then is the second sheet. Right. That doesn't include the what number are we on? 18. 18. So I didn't know if you wanted us to bring it back with that. Language. I would like to have that yes, language. Yes, that yeah. should be in it. Let us that okay. We'll bring that well, I was looking at the whole thing. I was looking I was. at the way you were right. looking at it. Yeah. So, so yeah. we'll come back to you with, with the combined yes. right. two right. sheets. Yeah. yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So we will. Um, Oh, you're going to retract your motion? I will. Okay. All right. And you're going to retract your second? I yep. Didn't oh, you didn't second? <laughs> I did. Oh, okay. I'll retract it. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. 19. Set the 2020 fees for Goose Rocks Beach parking stickers. No change? I move we accept them because we changed them last year. I okay. second. So that's $5 for residents, uh, seasonal, non-resident, daily, 25, non-resident, weekly, 100, and non-resident, seasonal, 200. Okay, but first and second, any more discussion? None. All in favor? Okay. 20, adopt the Goose Rock Speech parking sticker rules and regulations. I don't think there was any change to that either, so I'd move to adopt. I'll second it. First and second, any discussion? All in favor? 21, accept donation of $750 from the Nonanum Resort to the Emergency Fuel Fund. So moved. Second. First, <laughs> second, all in favor? Favor. And thank you very much. Yes. Greatly appreciate it. 21, accept donation, 22, excuse me, uh, accept donation of $389.67 from the Church on the Cape to the Emergency Fuel Fund. So moved. Second. All in favor? Great. Thank you. 23, accept donation of $150 from Alex and Judith Wacchiato to the nurses' fees account. So moved. Second. All in favor? Thank you. Other business? Mike? I have no other business. No other business. You will have. <laughs> I, have no, I have no other business. I no, do, I do want to, uh, one thing I did want to say, though, is that, uh, uh, and recognize is that the, anybody who stood out at the polls on Tuesday and watched the people come in, there were so many elderly people who came there with canes, with walkers, with uh, crutches. There was one, one in a boot. Uh, I have never seen anything like it. And they just meet. They 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 walk so slowly, but they. Wanted to, I'm talking people in their 80s, you know, or older. You're making me feel bad for voting absentee. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> but, 
What's that? I said, you're making me feel bad for having voted absentee. No, but one of them, one of the women said to me as she's walking up there, she, I, I was trying to help her. She was holding onto the railing. She had a thing, and she just said, you know, a lot of people died so that we can do this. Yeah, oh, absolutely. That's, what she, That's, true. That's what, yep. she yep. what she said. That's what she said. That's right. Yep. Takes it seriously. Yeah. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. I have nothing on um, I would like to thank Mike and the uh, workers in the town that helped us out at Prelude and putting it up and taking it down and anything in between and the falling over and <laughs> everything that happened. So thank you very much. And thanks to everybody that volunteered to help. Um, uh, I would just like to um, welcome Mike back onto the board. He was here when I came on originally. It's like having the band back together. <laughs> so congratulations on your victory. Thank you. Boss, what would you like? I'd say it's nice to have five selectmen again. <laughs> um, I just would uh, commend the work of the Solid Waste Committee. They have put yes. a lot of time and energy into this, um, taken a lot of time to educate themselves. Um, they've gotten a lot of feedback from me. They talk about Mike taking abuse. Well, Mike's been taking it from both sides, I would say, <laughs> and he's been the conduit. So thank you to Mike and thank you to the Solid Waste Committee. Um, many times people volunteer, and um, sometimes I wonder if it's more work for me or them, but um, the Solid Waste Committee has really put in their time and energy and, and really moved this forward, and, and I thank you. Yeah. You did an excellent job yes. tonight explaining everything. Thanks, Ken. And we really appreciate that. Thanks, and when Kendra. this comes out, Thank it's going to be bigger, better. It's going to like be like the bionic man. It's going to be better than it was before. Absolutely. Yes. Good. Okay. Very good. Is that all you have? I can talk all night. You can. Oh. <laughs> I move we approve the treasurer's warrants. Second. First, second. All in favor? I move we go home and watch uh, the <laughs> champion. Oh, oh yeah. I know. <laughs> move to adjourn. First, second. second. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Don't go away. Oh, that's right. The no, my dinner's going to get cold. I told you not to be home.